Book talk begins at 13 minutes and 23 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 675, Not-So-Secret History. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and our channel members on YouTube. This week, we would like to highlight Kathy Sharp, Gorlitza, Lisa B., Barbara Hutchinson, Melissa Weaver-Dunning, and our brand new patron, Rachel Brajo. Thank you so much for what you do for us We could not do this without you. Well, hello. How are you? I'm pretty good. I've I've been okay for two days in a row, which, you know. All right, then. So that's very pleasant, but it also means, boy, do I have a lot of stuff to do while I still feel good enough to be doing it, which probably will make me crash again. But I'm not going to think about that. (laughs) I'm just going to try and get some stuff done. In the meantime, by the time you listen to this, I will have randomly selected and contacted the winner of the Continuous Cables book and our new, brand new for October, raffle will have started. This is for the amazing quilt that Anne has made for us that Anne's two-step on Ravelry. It is bats. Heather, it's not owls. It's the perkiest little trio of of bats with very cute eyes and uh, and a beautifully quilted back. My mom helped me take pictures of this and her, her response was, wait, who made this? And you're doing what with it? You're raffling it off? Craftlet people really are the best people. And I said, I know. So huge thank you to Anne for making this and putting it up for everybody else to uh, get a chance to have. As far as uh, raffle entries, we're doing the same thing we've always done where uh, some things that you can do to enter the raffle require more time or effort. Some in this particular case will also include money like gifting somebody a membership or something like that. Nobody needs to pay anything in order to enter the raffle. And this time, because it is such a a big, beautiful thing that honestly, you could never buy this in a store. We are adding several different options, but we are also doing something that I used to do back in the past, which when we had bigger raffles like this, If you are interested in tossing your hat in the ring more than once, you can do more than one of the free options and just keep doing a different one every day and you'll get entered into the raffle uh, as another full ticket, basically. You'll get yourself another raffle ticket. Because I think we know that I am a a lousy businesswoman and I really... I came of age as a podcaster back in the days when, back when Brenda Dane on Cast On came came on after like 53 episodes and said, you know, guys, this is a lot of time and a lot of effort. And of course, her podcast was just so beautifully, seamlessly done. She made it look easy and it's not. And and she said, you know, if, every, if you just gave me a dollar, a dollar for each episode, then I could do this full time and I can bring you more really cool, interesting audio and interviews with people. And this was back when the internet was still largely free and mostly ad free. I know children, (laughs) that probably makes no sense to you. How could that possibly be? Well, it was, sorry, it was nice. It's not like that anymore, but 
be that as it may, Brenda Dane made that announcement and immediately lost listeners. And I have always been very nervous about this kind of thing because of that. But I'm at a point in life, and the internet has certainly grown up around me, that uh, I would like to keep doing this full time. And I have other shows that are percolating right now. We're collecting guests because it won't just be me. These will be me plus other people. But the same same concept as, as Craftlet. It's like you think you know this book because you think you read it in high school or maybe not, but you've heard about it or seen the movie. But when we dive into the book, it's much more, it's much more than just that. There are other topics that I care about that are, that could use a similar treatment. And so we are working on that right now. I am hoping that before the end of October, we will have the first episode of that out for you. And more will come on that Certainly, I'll have a special newsletter that I send out as soon as we're ready to make the episode go live. And we are setting up for a post-book live stream. So don't forget, send in questions, comments. You can call 206-350-1642 and just let us know this is a comment or a question for the post-book live stream. Or you can email Heather at craftlit.com with the same kind of note in the subject line so that I know where you want your question or comment to live. It could live in two places. You could send it in right now for an episode and I can read it or share it. Or you can tell me to, to save it and only use it on the conversation at the um, post book live stream. That post book live stream will happen the Sunday, the second Sunday in November. So before all the craziness starts, but a couple weeks after I've finished the book, which gives you a chance to finish the book as well. So as far as Patreon book parties and watch parties coming up, and again, you can increase your Patreon level if you wanted to join in the book party or the watch party for any given month and then pull it back down. Or I'm building in ways on Venmo and PayPal and things like that for you to be able to true up your membership wherever you have a membership to true it up using one of those or coffee, K-O-F-I, which is largely connected to YouTube. Other people use it too, but mostly it's connected to YouTube channels. Either way, there are plenty of different options if you don't want to be on the Patreon channel platform and I get it, and you still want access to all the fun, now you've got a way. And I'm seeing more and more people joining the Discord server, and it is so much fun. Everybody is sharing such cool stuff. And October's book party, it's the first time I'm going to have done something like this, and I cannot tell you how excited I am. Tara Worcester, who you know if you have been listening to the podcast, is awesome. And she is, she is responsible for having wrangled so many of you to make me the craftlet quilt, the knitted crocheted quilt for what was it, the 10 year anniversary, I think, which still just blows my mind. It is on Aaron's bed right now because Aaron's gone and I put my thing on it because it's pretty. So Tara is just amazing. But Tara pinged me a couple weeks ago and said, Have you ever read The Haunting of Hill House? Because I think maybe that would be an interesting book to do. Well, it was written in 1959, so I can't do it for a craft lit book, but we can do it for a book party book. So Shirley Jackson, master writer of suspense and creepy weirdness, with a great sense of humor, though. She wrote this book, The Haunting of Hill House. I, I am about halfway through it right now. It is so good. And when it is funny, it is really laugh out loud funny in absolutely craft litty ways to be funny. It is. There, there are a lot of literary jokes. One of the guys insults the Mrs. Danvers type woman, Mrs. Danvers from Rebecca, uh, as being the Belle Dame from the old poem, The Belle Dame Sons Mercy. And, it's just stuff like that, that it's just peppered, peppered throughout. It's so much fun. Tactical error on my part, because Andrew is actually traveling for work 
this week, and I am here in the house alone. So I'm not listening to any more right now, but we will put links in the show notes to um, a free version of this on YouTube. I was convinced that we would be able to get a free version through Audible because it's an older book. But no, it's not cheap. Tara found a free version that some British guy actually uh, read out loud, kind of like Phoebe reads a book. This guy did Haunting of Hill House. And I don't know if it's going to stay up or if there's going to be a copyright ding on it or what. But right now he has a chapter playlist breakdown. So it makes it much easier to listen. And yeah, we'll link out to those things in the show notes for you. And the best part about having that as our October book party is that Tara is going to be the guest host. And I could not be more excited to uh, to have somebody on who actually requested the text and have them there able to uh, chat with everybody else about what rocks their world about this particular book. I Anybody, any of you who join us, you are going to love this book. It, I, I mean, <clears throat> I've been reading for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights for a decade. I can't always listen <laughs> to the to the short stories that I do my little readings for because I get creeped out. But this so far, oh, it's so good. They did a movie, Liam Neeson, back in the 90s with Lily, oh, what's her face, who was in, Lily Taylor, who was in Mystic Pizza. It's uneven, but it's fun. And as I was watching it, I was like, there's no way this is based on the book. And so far, yeah, actually it is. It's just that the Shirley Jackson's writing is so much better than the dialogue in the movie, but it's also so dated. It would be really hard to bring the same kind of charm into a modern setting. So I'm very excited. Haunting of Hill House, that's going to be our October book. We're not going to do it on October 31st. We're going to do it the Thursday before. There's actually five Thursdays in October, and the last Thursday is Halloween. We're not going to do anything remotely like a book party on Halloween. That would be crazy, Heather. So instead, we're going to do it the week before. It'll be in the Craftlet calendar, and that'll be uh, both in the show notes and in the newsletter that we send out. And I'm very excited for the movie watch party for November. We're also going to do that not on the last Thursday of the month, because that would be Thanksgiving in the United States, and that won't fly. That dog won't hunt as it were. So we're going to do that the Thursday before. And this time uh, we are going to watch a really goofy, seasonally happy, lightweight movie called Fitzwilly. It came out the year I was born in 1967. And it's Dick Van Dyke doing Dick Van Dyke stuff. And who, who can argue with Dick Van Dyke doing Dick Van Dyke stuff? So Fitzwilly, I watched it, but not closely. And I, I was smiled. I smiled a lot. It was just kind of a, a comforting, comforting bag of chips. You know what I mean? So seasonal and fun, and you know, a little vintage, which is also kind of cool. There will not be a book party for December. There's just everybody has too much to do. That would be crazy. We'll come back to uh, book and watch parties in uh, in twenty twenty five. I can't believe it. So I called this episode Not So Secret History. And that is because yesterday I did something I didn't know if I was ever going to do again. I went into the little storage room where I have my knitting stuff and I pulled out the 2002 Vogue Map of the World Afghan. And I said, you know what? Gosh darn it. I feel good enough. And our little uh, yarn store here outside of just outside of New Hope, it's adorable. It's in an old house. It's got charm, charm and loveliness and really b beautiful yarn and very nice people. They do, uh, they just have a table in another room. And on some Sundays they have a spin in where obviously people come in to spin, but they also just have the table there so people can come in and knit. And I thought that they had a knitting group that showed up every Sunday that wasn't a spinning Sunday, like officially, because every time I go in, that's what's happening. It turned out, no, that's not an official group. It's just people go in to sit and knit. And I thought, well, I need basically an accountability partner <laughs> in finishing this thing. Because uh, I believe I had started this the year that I started podcasting. 
it was somewhere around then. Obviously, 2002 is when the pattern was released. We will link out to it and there will be images of other people's versions of this. I have two out of the four panels done and I'm almost done on the last leg of the third panel and then I'll have the the fourth panel to do. And then uh, one of the guys came up with a really interesting idea for backing it. I've been very nervous about trying to combine knit fabric with like a fleece backing, which is what they recommend. And he said, well, what if you, what if you used knit fabric? And I said, oh, well, now that's interesting. Tell me more about this idea. And he said, I don't know, but I think it would be really in some ways harder because you would have to make sure that, you know, things weren't being stretched out of shape in order for it to uh, feel good. But also, he said, you know, you could quilt it that way and you could quilt it by outlining with quilting all of the countries so that when you turn the quilt over and you see the back, you see the reverse map of the world as as hand quilting. And I thought, oh, this is why people go into stores and sit and knit and talk to human people. It was lovely. And I am really intrigued by this idea and I'm really excited. And I needed that to get me through this thing. I'm going to do it. I've now said it. So I, I guess I, I have to now. And I have a, a way, I have a, a mechanism by which I can, <laughs> I can finish it. I know that at least once a week, I'm going to take it and I'm going to work on it at Twist, at our, our little yarn store. He also, re- he, he reminded me about the Knit Companion app, which I helped work on way back in the day. I was the first voice of the, the little sheepy helper a thousand years ago. And I had forgotten that that was where I had moved my pattern to so I could keep track of it. And then I let the subscription lapse. And, and so when I showed up at the store, the only picture I had of the chart was the tiny, tiny, tiny one. And I, thank God, had brought a magnifying glass with me. So I was able to figure out where I had left off. But I hadn't marked it anywhere because it was marked in my Knit Companion app. So I was able to go in and resurrect the files, but not the the tracking, not the uh, where I left off. So that's all been reset. So now I have no excuses and I'm very excited. And for for you whippersnappers who are are new to this, it hasn't exactly been a running joke. It's certainly been an ongoing quest to try and finish this thing. And every so often I do get emails from people going, did you ever finish that? No, no, I didn't. Not yet. But it's huge. It is Afghan sized. It is beautiful. And it's also made of, uh, was it uh, Donegal tweed from actually Donegal, Ireland. And most of these colors are no longer uh, available. So I did start to think I was going to run out of the ocean color, the blue. And that's bad because there's a lot of ocean on our planet. So I did go on eBay. I was able to true up the the stash that I've got. So I think I've got enough yarn now to go through the whole bloody thing. And I'm going to do it. I really am. I swear to God, it's going to happen. I have now made it too public and I will be embarrassed. So there it is. We Oh, we watched Aisha for the watch party last week. What a charming little film. I I watched it the first time and it was lovely. And I thought, oh, well, yeah, that's kind of you know, a Bollywood version of Clueless, really. And Clueless is an excellent version of Emma. But watching it again with everybody else, they updated some things really beautifully. And and in some ways, the Emma story fits in India better than it did, I think, in Beverly Hills, which is intriguing. And I'm, I'm going to go back and watch it again. It is on Amazon Prime. You can find versions of it online for free with ads if you, uh, if you don't want to shell out for the rental. But, but yeah, it's, it's a lovely little film. It's, I mean, it's Emma. What can you say? It's great. Speaking of Emma, today we're doing just chapter 49. So volume three, chapter 13, chapter 49, if you're going straight through. 
So as far as today's chapters go, or chapter goes, this is the chapter I think everybody waits for. This is the big turning point. We've just had kind of, uh, in modern parlance, it would be Emma's dark night of the soul. Everything is lost. Uh, Harriet is in love with Knightley, and Knightley certainly seems to be in love with Harriet. Oh my God, my heart is breaking. I have to continue to be a good friend because I'm the one who got myself into this situation, and it's not Harriet's fault. So we we've hit that point. Now there has to be some kind of a resolution to that tension that they have created for us, that that Jane Austen created for us, and this chapter is the beginning of that release. But it is not going to untie all the knots that Emma has made throughout this book. She's going to have a little bit of work to do after this chapter. But that doesn't detract at all from what a perfect chapter today is, both in a a romance sense, but also a a character arc payoff sense. And that's going to make more sense to you when we are done listening and we we get to chat about some of the callbacks that Jane Austen is doing in this chapter. There's very little that I need to share with you in advance, except there is one callback that I wanted to just highlight for you because it actually does help to remember this. And if you'd been reading it all at once without having to wait for episodes, you probably would have remembered this on your own. Way back in the beginning, in chapter five, when Emma is being talked about by Knightley and Mrs. Weston. There is more conversating that happens with her later, but Knightley talks about her understanding, and that's a capital U. So even though Emma is not in the room while they are having this discussion, Emma does know that this is a topic. And he says, again, back in chapter five, Emma will never submit to anything requiring industry and patience and a subjection of the fancy to the understanding. Basically, she's like a lightweight intellectual. Yes, she knows what to say she understands and talks about and thinks about, but really she's not going deep into topics that really you benefit from deeper, more serious look. So he's the one who sets up that concept of of Emma being somebody who considers herself someone of deep understanding, understanding of the human condition, understanding of people in general. That's why she believes that she was such a good matchmaker. And there is there is a callback to that in today's chapter. But this time, the words are going to come from Emma's mouth, almost like an embarrassment. Like, I know I set myself up as the person who has this great understanding of things but I've grown enough to learn that and it may not be quite so much so. She is going to talk about Frank Churchill having imposed on her. This just means he he deceived her. It wasn't like he forced himself on her. That would be a completely different thing. This is just, she's been deceived by him. And then she'll she'll go on to say it was merely a blind, like a duck blind, like a hidden uh, decoy situation where, as we now know, Frank was looking like he was interested in Emma to help hide the fact that he and Jane Fairfax were, in fact, agreed for each other. And just like last week, this week, you're going to hear another reference to this concept of perfect happiness, finding finding your soulmate, finding uh, somebody who a- allows you to the confidence to feel that you have found perfect happiness with someone, someone who you are so settled with internally that there's there are no doubts it's just lovely and that's it let's listen to chapter 49 of jane austen's emma this is volume 3 chapter 13 if you are listening to your own version of the book please fast wind to 43 minutes and 3 seconds all right here we go volume 3 chapter 13 The weather continued much the same all the following morning, and the same loneliness and the same melancholy seemed to reign at Hartfield, but in the afternoon it cleared, the wind changed into a softer quarter, the clouds were carried off, the sun appeared, it was summer again. 
With all the eagerness which such a transition gives, Emma resolved to be out of doors as soon as possible. Never had the exquisite sight, smell, sensation of nature, tranquil, warm, and brilliant after a storm, been more attractive to her. She longed for the serenity they might gradually introduce, and on Mr. Perry's coming in soon after dinner with a disengaged hour to give her father, she lost no time in hurrying into the shrubbery. There, with spirits freshened, and thoughts a little relieved, she had taken a few turns, when she saw Mr. Knightley passing through the garden door and coming towards her. It was the first intimation of his being returned from London. She had been thinking of him the moment before as unquestionably sixteen miles distant. There was time only for the quickest arrangement of mind. She must be collected and calm. In half a minute they were together. The how do you do's were quiet and constrained on each side. She asked after their mutual friends. They were all well. When had he left them? Only that morning. He must have had a wet ride. Yes. He meant to walk with her, she found. He had just looked into the dining-room, and as he was not wanted there, preferred being out of doors. She thought he neither looked nor spoke cheerfully, and the first possible cause for it, suggested by her fears, was that he had perhaps been communicating his plans to his brother, and was pained by the manner in which they had been received. They walked together. He was silent. She thought he was often looking at her, and trying for a fuller view of her face than it suited her to give. And this belief produced another dread. Perhaps he wanted to speak to her of his attachment to Harriet— he might be watching for encouragement to begin. She did not, could not, feel equal to lead the way to any such subject. He must do it all himself. Yet she could not bear this silence. With him it was most unnatural. She considered, resolved, and trying to smile, began, "'You have some news to hear, now you are come back, that will rather surprise you.' "'Have I?' said he quietly, and looking at her. "'Of what nature?' "'Oh, the best nature in the world! A wedding!' After waiting a moment, as if to be sure she intended to say no more, he replied, "'If you mean Miss Fairfax and Frank Churchill, I have heard that already.' "'How is it possible?' cried Emma, turning her glowing cheeks towards him, for while she spoke it occurred to her that he might have called at Mrs. Goddard's in his way. I had a few lines on parish business from Mr. Weston this morning, and at the end of them he gave me a brief account of what had happened. Emma was quite relieved, and could presently say with a little more composure, You probably have been less surprised than any of us, for you have had your suspicions. I have not forgotten that you once tried to give me a caution. I wish I had attended to it, but, with a sinking voice and heavy sigh, I seem to have been doomed to blindness. For a moment or two nothing was said, and she was unsuspicious of having excited any particular interest, till she found her arm drawn within his and pressed against his heart, and heard him thus saying, in a tone of great sensibility, speaking low, Time, my dearest Emma, will heal the wound. Your own excellent sense, your exertions for your father's sake, I know you will not allow yourself. Her arm was pressed again, as he added, in a more broken and subdued accent, "'The feelings of the warmest friendship, indignation, abominable scoundrel!' And in a louder, steadier tone he concluded with, "'He will soon be gone. They will soon be in Yorkshire. I am sorry for her. She deserves a better fate.' Emma understood him, and as soon as she could recover from the flutter of pleasure excited by such tender consideration, replied, you are very kind, but you are mistaken, and I must set you right. I am not in want of that sort of compassion. My blindness to what was going on led me to act by them in a way that I must always be ashamed of, and I was very foolishly tempted to say and do many things which may well lay me open to unpleasant conjectures, but I have no other reason to regret that I was not in the secret earlier. Emma, cried he, looking eagerly at her, are you indeed? but checking himself. Uh, no, no, I understand you. Forgive me. I am pleased that you can say even so much. He is no object of regret, indeed, and it will not be very long, I hope, before that becomes the acknowledgment of more than your reason. Fortunate that your affections were not farther entangled. I never could, I confess, from your manners, assure myself as to the degree of what you felt. I could only be certain that there was a preference, and a preference which I never believed him to deserve— he is a disgrace to the name of man. 
and is he to be rewarded with that sweet young woman? Jane, Jane, you will be a miserable creature. Mr. Knightley, said Emma, trying to be lively, but really confused, I am in a very extraordinary situation. I cannot let you continue in your error, and yet perhaps since my manners gave such an impression, I have as much reason to be ashamed of confessing that I never have been at all attached to the person we are speaking of, as it might be natural for a woman to feel in confessing exactly the reverse, but I never have. He listened in perfect silence. She wished him to speak, but he would not. She supposed she must say more before she were entitled to his clemency, but it was a hard case to be obliged still to lower herself in his opinion. She went on, however. I have very little to say for my own conduct. I was tempted by his attentions, and allowed myself to appear pleased. An old story, probably, a common case, and no more than has happened to hundreds of my sex before. And yet it may not be the more excusable in one who sets up as I do for understanding. Many circumstances assisted the temptation. He was the son of Mr. Weston. He was continually here. I always found him very pleasant. And in short— for, with a sigh, let me swell out the causes ever so ingeniously, they all centre in this last. My vanity was flattered, and I allowed his attentions. Latterly, however, for some time indeed, I have had no idea of their meaning anything. I thought them a habit, a trick, nothing the called for seriousness on my side. He has imposed on me, but he has not injured me. I have never been attached to him— and now I can tolerably comprehend his behaviour. He never wished to attach me. It was merely a blind to conceal his real situation with another. It was his object to blind all about him, and no one, I am sure, could be more effectually blinded than myself, except that I was not blinded, that it was my good fortune, that, in short, I was somehow or other safe from him. She had hoped for an answer here, for a few words to say that her conduct was at least intelligible, but he was silent and as far as she could judge, deep in thought. At last, and tolerably in his usual tone, he said, "'I have never had a high opinion of Frank Churchill. I can suppose, however, that I may have underrated him. My acquaintance with him has been but trifling, and even if I have not underrated him hitherto, he may yet turn out well. With such a woman he has a chance. I have no motive for wishing him ill, and for her sake, whose happiness will be involved in his good character and conduct, I shall certainly wish him well.' I have no doubt of their being happy together, said Emma. I believe them to be very mutually and very sincerely attached. He is a most fortunate man, returned Mr. Knightley with energy. So early in life, at three and twenty, a period when, if a man chooses a wife, he generally chooses ill, at three and twenty to have drawn such a prize. What years of felicity that man in all human calculation has before him, assured of the love of such a woman— the disinterested love, for Jane Fairfax's character vouches for her disinterestedness, everything in his favour, equality of situation, I mean as far as regards society, and all the habits and manners that are important, equality in every point but one, and that one, since the purity of her heart is not to be doubted, such as must increase his felicity, for it will be his to bestow the only advantages she wants." A man would always wish to give a woman a better home than the one he takes her from, and he who can do it, where there is no doubt of her regard, must, I think, be the happiest of mortals. Frank Churchill is, indeed, the favourite of fortune. Everything turns out for his good. He meets with a young woman at a watering-place, gains her affection, cannot even weary her by negligent treatment, and had he and all his family sought round the world for a perfect wife for him, they could not have found her superior— his aunt is in the way, his aunt dies, he has only to speak, his friends are eager to promote his happiness, he had used everybody ill, and they are all delighted to forgive him. He is a fortunate man indeed. You speak as if you envied him. And I do envy him, Emma. In one respect he is the object of my envy. Emma could say no more. They seemed to be within half a sentence of Harriet, and her immediate feeling was to avert the subject, if possible. She made her plan. She would speak of something totally different, the children in Brunswick Square, and she waited only for breath to begin, when Mr. Knightley startled her by saying, "'You will not ask me what is the point of envy. You are determined, I see, to have no curiosity. You are wise. But I cannot be wise. Emma, I must tell you what you will not ask, though I may wish it unsaid the next moment.' 
"'Oh, then don't speak it, don't speak it,' she eagerly cried. "'Take a little time, consider, do not commit yourself.' "'Thank you,' said he, in an accent of deep mortification, and not another syllable followed. Emma could not bear to give him pain. He was wishing to confide in her, perhaps to consult her. Cost her what it would, she would listen. She might assist his resolution or reconcile him to it. She might give just praise to Harriet, or by representing to him his own independence, relieve him from that state of indecision which must be more intolerable than any alternative to such a mind as his. They had reached the house. "'You are going in, I suppose,' said he. "'No.' "'replied Emma, quite confirmed by the depressed manner in which he still spoke. "'I should like to take another turn. Mr. Perry is not gone.' "'And after proceeding a few steps, she added, "'I stopped you ungraciously just now, Mr. Knightley, and I am afraid gave you pain. "'But if you have any wish to speak openly to me as a friend, "'or to ask my opinion of anything that you may have in contemplation, "'as a friend indeed you may command me, I will hear whatever you like. "'I will tell you exactly what I think.' "'As a friend,' repeated Mr. Knightley. "'Emma, that, I fear, is a word—no, I have no wish. "'Stay, yes, why should I hesitate? "'I have gone too far already for concealment. "'Emma, I accept your offer. "'Extraordinary as it may seem, I accept it, "'and refer myself to you as a friend. "'Tell me, then, have I no chance of ever succeeding?' "'He stopped in his earnestness to look the question, "'and the expression of his eyes overpowered her. "'My dearest Emma,' said he, "'for dearest you will always be, "'whatever the event of this hour's conversation. "'My dearest, most beloved Emma, "'tell me at once, say no if it is to be said.' "'She could really say nothing. "'You are silent,' he cried with great animation. "'Absolutely silent. "'At present I ask no more.' Emma was almost ready to sink under the agitation of this moment. The dread of being awakened from the happiest dream was perhaps the most prominent feeling. "'I cannot make speeches, Emma,' he soon resumed, and in a tone of such sincere, decided, intelligible tenderness as was tolerably convincing. "'If I loved you less, I might be able to talk about it more. But you know what I am. You hear nothing but truth from me.' I have blamed you and lectured you, and you have borne it as no other woman in England would have borne it. Bear with the truths I would tell you now, dearest Emma, as well as you have borne with them. The manner, perhaps, may have as little to recommend them. God knows I have been a very indifferent lover. But you understand me. Yes, you see, you understand my feelings, and will return them if you can. At present I ask only to hear, once to hear your voice. While he spoke, Emma's mind was most busy, and with all the wonderful velocity of thought had been able, and yet without losing a word, to catch and comprehend the exact truth of the whole, to see that Harriet's hopes had been entirely groundless, a mistake, a delusion, as complete a delusion as any of her own, that Harriet was nothing, that she was everything herself, that what she had been saying relative to Harriet had been all taken as the language of her own feelings— and that her agitation, her doubts, her reluctance, her discouragement, had been all received as discouragement from herself. And not only was there time for these convictions, with all their glow of attendant happiness, there was time also to rejoice that Harriet's secret had not escaped her, and to resolve that it need not and should not. It was all the service she could now render her poor friend, for as to any of that heroism of sentiment which might have prompted her to entreat him to transfer his affection from herself to Harriet, as infinitely the most worthy of the two, or even the more simple sublimity of resolving to refuse him at once and for ever, without vouchsafing any motive, because he could not marry them both, Emma had it not. She felt for Harriet with pain and with contrition, but no flight of generosity run mad, opposing all that could be probable or reasonable, entered her brain. She had led her friend astray, and it would be a reproach to her forever, but her judgment was as strong as her feelings, and as strong as it had ever been before, in reprobating any such alliance for him, as most unequal and degrading. Her way was clear, though not quite smooth. She spoke then on being so entreated. What did she say? Just what she ought, of course. A lady always does. She said enough to show there need not be despair, and to invite him to say more himself. He had despaired at one period, he had received such an injunction to caution and silence as for the time crushed every hope, she had begun by refusing to hear him. 
The change had perhaps been somewhat sudden, her proposal of taking another turn, her renewing the conversation which she had just put an end to, might be a little extraordinary. She felt its inconsistency, but Mr. Knightley was so obliging as to put up with it, and seek no farther explanation. Seldom, very seldom does complete truth belong to any human disclosure. Seldom can it happen that something is not a little disguised or a little mistaken. But where, as in this case, though the conduct is mistaken, the feelings are not, it may not be very material. Mr. Knightley could not impute to Emma a more relenting heart than she possessed, or a heart more disposed to accept of his. He had, in fact, been wholly unsuspicious of his own influence. He had followed her into the shrubbery with no idea of trying it. He had come in his anxiety to see how she bore Frank Churchill's engagement, with no selfish view, no view at all, but of endeavouring, if she allowed him an opening, to soothe or to counsel her. The rest had been the work of the moment, the immediate effect of what he heard on his feelings. The delightful assurance of her total indifference towards Frank Churchill, of her having a heart completely disengaged from him, had given birth to the hope, that in time he might gain her affection himself. But it had been no present hope. He had only, in the momentary conquest of eagerness over judgment, aspired to be told that she did not forbid his attempt to attach her. The superior hopes which gradually opened were so much the more enchanting. The affection which he had been asking to be allowed to create, if he could, was already his. Within half an hour he had passed from a thoroughly distressed state of mind to something so like perfect happiness that it could bear no other name. Her change was equal. This one half-hour had given to each the same precious certainty of being beloved, had cleared from each the same degree of ignorance, jealousy, or distrust. On his side there had been a long-standing jealousy, old as the arrival or even the expectation of Frank Churchill. He had been in love with Emma, and jealous of Frank Churchill, from about the same period, one sentiment having probably enlightened him as to the other. It was his jealousy of Frank Churchill that had taken him from the country. The Box Hill party had decided him on going away. He would save himself from witnessing again such permitted and courage attentions. He had gone to learn to be indifferent. But he had gone to a wrong place. There was too much domestic happiness in his brother's house. Woman wore too amiable a form in it. Isabella was too much like Emma, differing only in those striking inferiorities which always brought the other in brilliancy before him, for much to have been done, even had his time been longer. He had stayed on, however, vigorously, day after day, till this very morning's post had conveyed the history of Jane Fairfax. Then, with the gladness which must be felt, nay, which he did not scruple to feel, having never believed Frank Churchill to be at all deserving Emma, was there so much fond solicitude, so much keen anxiety for her, that he could stay no longer. He had ridden home through the rain, and had walked up directly after dinner, to see how this sweetest and best of all creatures, faultless in spite of all her faults, bore the discovery. He had found her agitated and low. Frank Churchill was a villain. He heard her declare that she had never loved him. Frank Churchill's character was not desperate. She was his own Emma, by hand and word, when they returned into the house, and if he could have thought of Frank Churchill then, he might have deemed him a very good sort of fellow. End of chapter 13 Yay! Oh, it's such a happy chapter. I'm so happy. I don't think there's ever been a character for whom I have loved their inner monologue more than what we see with Mr. Knightley here, where he's, he starts off, you know, Frank is a horrible, horrible person. But then by the end, by the end of the chapter, his appreciation of Frank Churchill has changed quite a bit. He's much more willing to be generous uh, about Frank Churchill by the end. But we, we'll talk about that in a minute. So first things first, Emma is in a bad place when the chapter starts. And she is so nervous talking to Knightley that she almost shuts things down too fast. And if this was a bad rom-com, you know, this would have actually been a major plot point. Like she stops him from saying what's in his heart because she thinks she knows that it's going to be all about Harriet and she can't take it. <sighs> bite, bite of the knuckle moment. And then it takes much longer for them to get around to actually being honest with each other. Jane Austen's already done plenty of the knuckle biting so far. She can allow Emma the 
opportunity to both see what her silencing of him does to him and recognize that even if he is going to say something that hurts her, shutting him down is worse. I think that is a beautiful moment of character growth and recognition of the needs of the people around you, which is hard when you're especially wrapped up in your own head and it's all drama in your head. It's a very hard thing to pull out and do, and she does it. And of course, it pays off marvelously for her, which is lovely for all of us too. I thought that Mr. Knightley's kind of diatribe, sort of diatribiness about Frank Churchill was also interesting, culminating largely with him saying he is a favorite of fortune. Everything goes his way. If there weren't such exquisite examples of how frustrating it can be to watch this in real life, it would be very easy to think, well, this is just a contrivance. I mean, no, nobody is this lucky in real life. And actually, no, there are people for whom things just seem to all work out in the end. And I, I don't know karmically what has happened to them. If they do good with that for other people, then I am more than happy to, to say, well, karma actually did a good. And how lovely that they are getting the rewards for all of the hard work that they that they put into it. It's a little harder to say that about Frank. So Knightley's observation is, I, I think, not without merit, but also not bad writing. I think in the hands of a, of a less adept and astute author as Jane Austen, it could have been just sloppy, but it's not. He has earned being able to say that about Frank. But then we come to passage of Knightley's that I think may honestly be the most romantic sentence that, for me, that we have read in any of our books. It's because it's almost something that you could imagine coming out of Rochester's mouth. It's something that you could almost expect to hear on a good day from one of those, you know, brooding, byronic, heroic figureheads who always turned out to be, you know, such lousy, lousy boyfriends and worse husbands, tenant of Wildfell Hall, but who we all women and men, because I know some gay men who have had these same exact relationships, whatever the problem is, it can be very attractive and that's rough, buddy. But here we have a moment from Mr. Knightley that is oh, just so beautiful. He's had such a hard time talking to Emma about any of this. It hurts good <laughs> to watch. But when he says, I cannot make speeches, Emma, if I loved you less, I might be able to talk about it more. But you know what I am. You hear nothing but the truth from me. I have blamed you. I have lectured you. And you have borne it in ways that no other woman in England would have borne it. Bear with the truths I would tell you now, dearest Emma, as well as you have borne with them. The manner perhaps may have as little to recommend them, God knows. I have been a very indifferent lover. But you understand me. Yes, you see, you understand my feelings. There is a double dash, there, there's an M dash there, before he says, yes, you see, you understand my feelings. That is letting us know that Emma's face has now erupted into smiles. And so he, he's able to ramp it up a little bit. You see, you understand my feelings, another M dash, and will return them if you can. At present, I ask only to hear once, to hear your voice. I mean, I'm sorry. A romance that is built on actually knowing each other so well. When someone says something that seems so simple, but the other person knows like what the cost was, how hard this was for them to say out loud, and then to have that reflected back to them in, in happiness and understanding and awareness is such a vindication of love and a validation of the the honesty and the love that's going on between them. And I never would have gotten that from such a simple little paragraph if I hadn't been paying more attention to some of the stuff that Knightley is doing very quietly in the 
background all the time. And I think importantly, very importantly, when he left to go to London and when he came back, he came back because he thought Emma needed moral support because she was heartbroken over Frank, not because he thought, ah, now I can make my move. In fact, it, it was entirely the opposite. He would not have had this conversation. He would have, if Emma had actually been heartbroken, have done nothing but console her. He would have thought nothing about the fact, or well, he would have thought about it, but he certainly wouldn't have acted on the fact that he loves her. And I think that's a really, really important thing to pay attention to, because otherwise, especially their age difference, can look really creepy, except he's never been predatory about Emma. And, and you never see it quite as clearly, I think, as you, as you do in this chapter, that really he did not expect anything like this to happen. And he's certainly not complaining, but never expected it. And then Jane Austen does something that is actually about a hundred years too early. She does kind of a James Joyce thing where Salinger thing, where you've got a, an internal monologue happening in her head, but it's all of this is happening at once in her head. And I think we've all probably experienced that moment where so many emotion things are flying around inside your head and you're feeling them all at once and you're, you've got adrenaline in your system. So you really can think faster. But when Jane Austen says, while he spoke, Emma's mind was most busy and with all the wonderful velocity of thought had been able, and yet without losing a word, to catch and comprehend the exact truth of the whole. And then that's an entire brick of text that comes after it. All of her understandings about how Harriet fits into this, about her past with Knightley, about how she felt for Harriet with pain and with contrition, but no flight of generosity run mad, opposing all that could be probable or reasonable entered her brain. I'm not going to give Knightley up to her just because I feel bad. That's just crazy talk, people. And then Jane Austen ends that, that brick of text with, and what did she say? What a lady always does. She said enough to show there need not be despair and to invite him to say more himself. He had despaired at one period. He had received such an injunction to caution and silence as for the time crushed every hope. She had begun by refusing to hear him the change had perhaps been somewhat sudden. Her proposal of taking another turn, her renewing the conversation, which she had just put an end to, might be a little extraordinary. She felt its inconsistency, but Mr. Knightley was so obliging as to put up with it and seek no further explanation. There is no, why did you hesitate? It's just, they understand each other. And then Austin riffs on some popular psychology. I mean, it's too early to really be using that word, but popular philosophy conversations that were, were happening out in the world uh, during this time, a little bit before this and, and now, when she says, seldom, very seldom does complete truth belong to any human disclosure. Seldom can it happen that something is not a little disguised or a little mistaken, but where, as in this case, though the conduct is mistaken, the feelings are not. That, that idea of a complete understanding between two people is actually part of a larger conversation that was happening at the time. That, that human judgment could never be infallible. If humans are involved, it's always at risk of being improperly reasoned or, or poorly thought through. And sometimes it's hard to be honest, <clears throat> whether you're talking about people on the outside of you or in your own head. It can be hard to, to be completely honest. But here, they have a complete truth between the two of them. And that's, that is a beautiful thing. And I was trying to think last night, where have we ever in modern popular culture seen characters for whom there's some kind of a romantic tension or sexual tension where we've seen them get together in a, a show, a series, or even a, a book series, not just television or, or miniseries series. Where have we seen ones that haven't, where the relationship just hasn't gotten completely boring? And I thought, well, there's the Thin Man movies. 
<laughs> Which, honest to God, if you haven't ever watched any of the Thin Man movies, you just need to know you will be tickled pink. They are just such fun. And the Myrna Loy in the first one wrinkles her nose in such a beautifully little, adorable, goofball way that I think she is forever endeared to Aaron, to Thing One, uh, just from the nose wrinkle. He loved that movie. All of the ones that I could think of were kind of failures at making it work once they get together, except shows that Michael Schur has done. And I'm thinking very specifically about The Good Place, but other shows that he's done as well. There is something about him as a person. And Kristen Bell talked about this on the record. There's something about him in person and about the people he surrounds himself with in order to create the shows that he has created that is just a uniquely uh, bright and funny but very thoughtful group of creators that he has been working with. And I thought the the characters in The Good Place, it, it takes a while. They have to get there. And it doesn't not hurt the process of getting them there. But when they do, there is no fun lost. There is no tension lost. In fact, the show gets better. And it's that's what life should be. It shouldn't be that you 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 meet, you fall in love, it's romantic, that's awesome. You get married and then it's just every day of the rest of your life. You're not going to have that same kind of romance. What you have after should be richer and deeper and more fulfilling, more more close to a complete truth. And that takes work. And we're just not very good at that kind of work anymore, at least not in the States. It's it's hard. It's hard to feel safe about doing that kind of work too. But boy, is it worth it when it pays off. I am I am very lucky. I know how lucky I am to have found and to have convinced Andrew to marry me. <laughs> and he claims that he he is lucky too. I don't know. I feel you uniquely positioned to be able to say it's work and it's and it's worth it even though i know there is nothing unique about where i'm at in saying that so so many people have found the same thing in their relationships in their life and i think we need to talk about the what happens after the romance in a more positive light more often so i'm very happy to have that moment here like this is not the end of fun and love for the two of them at all. But especially nightly, immediately, once Emma's like, yes, 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 a thousand times yes moment, nightly immediately goes, well, Frank, you shouldn't be too hard on Frank. I mean, sure, he was a, he was a little bit of a rat there, but you, it's, it's, it's understandable. It's understandable, and I, I, I get it. And by the end... <laughs> He had found her agitated and low. Frank Churchill was a villain. He'd heard her declare that she had never loved him. Frank Churchill's character was not so desperate. She was his own Emma by hand and word when they returned into the house. And if he could have thought of Frank Churchill then, if he could have thought of Frank Churchill then, he couldn't, he was thinking about Emma, he might have deemed him a very good sort of fellow. And that is so knightly. Oh my gosh, that is just so knightly. He is so good at recognizing when somebody has been doing the work and has improved. And Frank may have been a real loser when it comes to playing the uh, straight up morals game and is certainly lucky to have found Jane. And Jane is lucky not to have to go be a governess. But Knightley's ability to uh, see the whole picture and give credit where credit is due is it's a beautiful piece of his personality. And in fact, last week I said I couldn't read all of Christine, Tin of Tan's Christine. I couldn't read all of her email last week because it was going to give something away. And this is what she wrote. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing for us to end on. 
I've never caught Emma's defense of Frank Churchill's doting on his aunt before listening to it this time around. S- somewhere at the end of volume two, where Emma Emma actually does, it's not making excuses for Frank's behavior, but it is recognizing the importance of the due that is being paid to his aunt, uh, and even to the point of making everybody miserable by having to you know leave at the drop of a hat and go go deal with her. And then Christine went on to say, I wonder if Mr. Knightley considered Emma's need to dote on her father in his proposal as a result. He is a thoughtful character, but his proposal, and and we haven't really hit the perfect, the complete proposal bit yet, but we can see, we can see the writing on the wall now. And she said, Mr. Knightley is a thoughtful character, but his proposal used to hit me as too thoughtful to believe before. And I, I can see that, that his, his figuring out of how they are going to make this relationship work as we go through these last few chapters of the book is going to, at some point, seem kind of superhuman. But Jane Austen's already laid that groundwork about how important treating the people who came before you in life is to the characters in this book in particular, with Frank, with, with Mrs. Churchill and Emma with her father. And, and even, I mean, it even goes on to uh, Miss Taylor, Mrs. Weston, and her deference to and her care for Mr. Woodhouse. There's a lot of generational love that is going on that we might look at these days and say, wow, that is deeply codependent and that is going to be uh, unfair to Emma slash Frank. And yeah, probably in today's world, that would be an easy argument to make. But I think it's kind of easy to see why Knightley, a man who who lives alone, who spends most of his time talking to his gameskeeper, his groundkeeper, I think it's pretty easy to see that for him, devoting that kind of time and attention to another human, whether it's their parent or somebody else, is a, a sign of character, of good, good, solid character. And that's something that Mr. Knightley certainly respects. All right. That is it. I hope you have a great week. I will, by now I will have contacted the Continuous Cables book winner, and that should be on its way to them. And the quilt raffle will be open for business as soon as you listen to this. And yeah, that's it. You take care of yourself. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's It's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.